Okay guys, Colin Mushman here as SNG Man 101 and today we're going to be looking at a four-man heads-up tournament that I just played on Poker Stars at the $11 buy-in. So the winner of two straight matches gets four times the buy-in and the other three players receive nothing. And I think it's a really interesting dynamic here both because of the way that uh, we match up with our opponent in, in both cases, and I also think I may have made a couple of not not the best plays in the second match. And one thing that's part of the process of improving as a player, probably the most important part, is taking a look at your own hand histories and hands that you've played, and just thinking yourself about how you might improve upon it and your own analysis can really be helpful so you know videos that you watch of others of course are gold and posting on sites like Sox Poker Forums 2 plus 2 but even just watching your own games is super helpful okay here um, take the, the first hand with a pretty standard um, pre for players continuation but he limps and we're gonna attack but it limps fairly wide against an unknown opponent uh, King 8 suited is definitely an above average hand, and in general, a button limp will mean weakness. And now we're going to continuation bet, uh, which we do about 95% of the time after raising preflop like that. Now, you can raise any two cards before the flop heads up when you have the button. Out of position, that's certainly not true, but when it's your button. If he checks, will of course bet. Uh, he hasn't really done much so far this match so we are simply going to fold. Okay, they're checking your raising there fine and it's unlikely he's going to have connected with a paired flop like this so we'll go out and fire a bet and when that doesn't work we're pretty much done with the hand unless we improve we check and we won't call anything and if he checks uh, there's a very slight chance queen high will be good but if he wants to bet uh, we certainly fold Okay, so he just he had a nine eye. Uh, I believe he flopped a gut shot then. Ace ten, very legitimate raising hand. And even though you miss, statistically the flop just as often with a hand like ace ten as you do a hand like three eight. Not only, of course, are your pairs better when you make them, but also. Like th this situation right here, we flop two over cards. So now when we make our C bet, it's kind of a semi buff because we have six outs to improve to an over pair. And we'll check behind again for that reason, because uh, we thirteen percent of the time we're going to improve to an over pair. And if he checks, we'll definitely check behind. And you know, a lot of the time it's not going to be okay. So we have bottom pair. Uh, it doesn't turn out to be best, but ace high can always be best in a pot where, you know, there's y y y even not, not, you know, a little bit of betting, but not, not even too extreme an amount of betting. It's just, you know, uh, guys miss most hands and heads up, and ace high beats an unimproved hand. So, we come in with a mid-king for a standard two and a half blind raise. opponent likes to consider his actions <laughs> and we will uh, definitely fire away and bet roughly two-thirds the pot then we pick up a double uh, gut shot draw went to the ass end of the shade went to the real end and okay so we'll only call a very small bet if he checks we'll gladly check behind and we can't even call that because you know, even if he doesn't have the straight, if he's got any hand 
um, besides the off chance to a pair of threes and then mistakenly value betting that, uh, then run beat. So getting 2.8 to 1 isn't quite good enough. You know, getting um, like 5 to 1, I'd be a lot more inclined to call that. And Low King isn't a great hand, but he's been bunny lumping a lot. Um, it worked out there. That's certainly the weakest hand you want to attack a bunny lump with. In this, you know, you're going to get away with it a huge amount of the time. And limping with a weak hand <laughs> is really a great play if your opponent is letting you get away with it. Because you want to play with your buttons since you'll be getting 3 to 1 to call and you've got position. And normally, a uh, reason you might be hesitant is because if your opponent is raising your button, but make him prove to you that he actually will raise your button limps, because all the guys won't, and when they don't, and they're not adjusting to you well, then that's great. Uh, you, you gain a lot that way. And see, right, right now, for instance, we pick up a pair of tens kind of randomly, and that's most likely the best hand. And if we check, of course, we can't really call a bet because this board is so coordinated. So we definitely want to be the one to spread out ourselves. And our hand's probably best, but we're definitely happy to stuff and fold right then. Now, one of the reasons that I'm only racing to 80 is because with our, uh, more marginal raises, we don't raise to something like 90 or 100. And it's pretty obvious, even for guys who aren't paying too much attention, when your bet size is 100% like correlated <laughs> with hand strength. So I'm trying to mix it up a little bit there. Uh, the pot's 374, but notice that we have a 4 out draw to the nuts, and there is a slight chance our ace high is going to. And he probably has uh, a jack or a seven or something here. And I'm not going to try to take it away with a bluff. Wow, when he has pocket nines, that's kind of surprising because most guys uh, will certainly uh, raise or re raise with the tens. Most guys, even who aren't, who are really passive, like this guy, who's, you know, 90 and zero, um, even guys who are that uh, passive tend to realize that a mid-high pocket pair is one strong enough to raise the re-raise with. So it's kind of an unusual flaw on his part, showing a very extreme version of what would we already knew, <laughs> that this is a passive mofo. So a pair of twos, again, is, is going to be statistically the best hand any p pair is likely to be the best hand. And jack six isn't a very good one to build a pot, so we're going to choose a different hand to uh, to raise with a button to raise against the button limp. And on this board again, <laughs> you know we think our hand's probably best, but it's really coordinated, so we don't want to be the one calling a bet. And then even a four head, we could, you know, really easily get out drawn. Pretty much any diamond, seven, five, ten, or over card. But now, with top and bottom pair, we need to come out with a very large bet to both get value for a very strong hand and prevent another card, like a seven or a ten, coming that really devalues our hand on the river. And that's a fine result to sevenfold right there. The meat connectors actually play pretty well after the flop, so I'm happy to pop this up a little. Say them, son. What you got? And a few chicks. Obviously. <laughs> you guys know the drill by this point. We see about him. And excellent. I've said it before in my videos, and I'll say it again, that the little uh, algorithm, uh, if you will, of 
just raising before the flop, and when he checks to you, betting the flop um, of around two thirds the pot, then uh, that's really powerful right there, and that's a very basic aggression principle. In this hand at the turn, he had shown a lot of weakness. The turn card didn't look like it would change anything, so that's a very standard and reasonable time to throw out a bet, and you, you should definitely do that. If you're out of position, you check and your opponent checks behind. Make a habit of coming out with a uh, bet on the turn, even if you have nothing, because that's a powerful bluffing, bluffing opportunity. And if you limp before the flop, I'm going to go ahead and bump this up, and your opponent checks and then he checks the flop, you should go ahead and generally come out with a small bet, which should be pretty high percentage. And we have Obviously, we'll see about that gut shot straight draw, and very happy to win immediately. So we'll raise the mid suited king, low mid suited king. It'd be nice to take it immediately. If not, it doesn't play so bad after the flop. And we have a couple of backdoor draws here too, to couple with our overcard. So a few checks, we have a no-brainer bet. Come out with 140. Pretty much hoping this guy folds, and if not, that we pick up a powerful draw at the turn. Nice. And this hand isn't quite strong enough to raise up on the limp. It wouldn't be a bad play necessarily if you did, but I'll go ahead and wait till I have a little more value. Just give him that one. So we try to uh, take advantage of the fact that he's letting us slump. And with an overcard and a draw to another ass straight draw, uh, we'll go ahead and throw out a little bet. Generally, uh, min bet looks kind of weak, but it's not so bad if you use it sparingly. And when he checks again with his check, um, we, we, it's possible a jack high is best, or you could very easily have um, a pair of fours or fives. And yay, so you add that in addition to a good shot trade draw. So that's certainly legit that he would call a bet on that flop. And eight king is strong enough that we figure to be ahead of his range, and we can be the aggressor here. Sorry about that. I just, I just got a new cell phone ring that sounds like Frank Sinatra doing um, White Christmas. And I'm, I'm, I'm a little on the fence. <laughs> so I may have to go. Uh, I'm going to come in and just sort of raise, um, raise pretty wide. It's never too big a mistake to raise your button in heads up. No limit play. And we're going to go ahead and make a standard c-bet. Now we've picked up a gut shot draw as well, so we're definitely not going to try to bluff. But we, we might bet bluff the river if... No, no, this is a terrible... <laughs> okay, so obviously we're not calling uh, this bet, but if he had checked even, um, there's no way we'd bluff it, because if he's on any kind of a draw, then he sits that draw. <laughs> If he had, uh, you know, any hand, or a draw to any hand, then he had it, so that would be a terrible card to try to bluff at. Um, with a little queen, we're just going to come in and raise small. Because these are hands that, you know, are above average, but just don't play very well in large pots. You know, if all the money goes in, a lot of the times you'll be dominated. So you come in and be the aggressor with a probable best hand. But you're not looking to play a very big pot. So I've I've got to uh, give up on this hand. Uh, there's a very slight chance our queen is good, but <laughs> we're not finding out. And you know what? It's tough when several consecutive 
continuation bets fail like that. But I'll tell you what, guys, it is a profitable strategy in the long run. And, you know, your opponents, so now he's checked behind, we bet any two. And um, your opponents um, can change strategies and begin raising you very wide, but you need very strong evidence to assume that's the case. And, you know, my best guess is this guy has picked up some cards and you really just want to keep on C betting because it's very profitable. <laughs> so now with top two, we, we fire on this one. And one thing to notice is that, you know, this particular opponent probably isn't thinking too actively about exploiting us. But even if you're up against a really good guy who is actively trying to exploit you, he can't really get much information from your C bet, you know, except that you're going to throw it a bet often, besides the fact, um, you know, nothing really, because you do when you hit and when you miss. I Here with my top pair, it's a very vulnerable top pair, though. I'm going to go ahead and just make a huge bet, because there's no way I can fold, but um, so many turn cards I can't play with. And now I obviously I <laughs> have to call due to pot odds, and I think at the very least he's got an 8, most like he could have a better 9, but... Okay, so he's got 9-7, and we're drawing very... Okay, so he managed to split it with a split full house. Um, I don't think he must play that at all, though, because we've been really aggressive, and he had top pair, so I think he's got to be willing to take that to showdown. So, <laughs> you know, it sucks this guy drew on us, but I, I don't think it was like a dumb suck out. I think that was, you know, pretty pretty good play on his part, being willing to, to take that all the way. And King Jack, um, oh, we're, we're just going to show this, I mean, that's a strong hand, and it's up. There's 300 sitting on the table, and that's absolutely strong enough to shove immediately. <laughs> and we gain a lot of money folds, and if you called, you know, a lot of the time, we're going to be a slight dog to hand, like Ace-8 or something. Uh, this is strong enough to just shove, and that would be unexploitable, but... Against this guy, where he take advantage of his rare three bets and build the pot a little. And this hand is almost certainly best, so we'll come in with a pretty solid value bet. And if he re raised, we have to call. I'm gonna just get it all in here. I mean, the pot's a thousand, we've got eight, 800 left. So when you combine that with the fact that he probably plays chicks stronger and our huge fold equity, um, we find outs in case he does have a better hand. Yeah, it's, it's it's a very nice result, but um, oh, nice pocket aces. But uh, there just aren't a lot of hands there he could have that have a speed. I mean, again, he probably plays six a little stronger. Uh, maybe not this guy actually. Who knows? But and tend to be a pretty random thing for him to have. So with the aces, normally um, with even my stronger hands, I go ahead and shove. Aces and kings are. I guess the only two where I, I'm making a smaller raise and taking my chances. So we connect very nicely, but it's a very vulnerable way to be connected because an 8, a 4, a club, so many cards would devalue our hand. So we bet big defensively and for value. And we're, we're going to make it clear that <laughs> if he wants to play this one, it's for all his chips. And, you know, uh, if you would call that that's okay too but we're ha really just happy to win it right there uh, and we don't like the fact with most guys um with, with this guy really that he would raise um because he's so passive but ace nine is way too strong not to just come in and shove because um you know with, with ten blinds shallow uh you you've got to be willing to take it all the way against anybody and uh <laughs> great so that last um match, we ended up like, not, not a huge favorite, like a 60-40 favorite, and, but that's still very nice. Any edge is great and heads up, and um, that worked out great. So now we're in match number two, and the starting blinds and stacks differ, uh, or double. So he makes a pretty bizarre min raise out of position, and... I think I'm just going to bet this, so... 
figure out, and that's a pretty strange sequence <laughs> of bets to minimize out of position, and then um, f fold to a bet, so it looks pretty weak. And 10 8 will go ahead and attack, attack make an actor's play pretty well off to the flop, and this is really a, a semi bluff with two overcards. And that's a really bad turn for us because if you like the flop, <laughs> this is uh, a card you're going to like if you like the flop. It also doesn't improve us, so we've got to give up here. And we could either limp or make a small raise. Again, this goofy little min raise. <laughs> And I'm not sure he's going to try that same play twice. Now here we're getting 5 to 1. Um, I'm going to call and then bluff the river if he checks. And now I'll just check behind if I can. So we can only beat a bluff. But calling, we also learn what he has. Uh, I think on balance, this is a fold. But with any better odds, you should call. And I, in this particular instance, I do really like to call. But I... <laughs> looking at this, and... Okay, wow, he's got pocket aces, so that's... Um, so that particular time is strange. Out of position, min has indicated a, a very strong hand. But that call was uh, certainly anything more you you would definitely want to fold. And even calling the 120 is a little marginal. So King 7 is definitely legit. We're coming for two and a half blinds. And when an ace flops and you're you betting, you don't have to usually bet quite as much. Because if he doesn't have the ace, then even the hand that he's drawn to, his top pair, is worse than what you're representing. we got to give it up to him here. And it looks like he's playing, um, based on a limited number of hands, a pretty loose style. So we're going to have to try to play a bit more for value. He's 10 more than qualifies, of course. Coming for a standard for a blind attack. And even though we're playing, looking to play for value, we always see bet. <laughs> Again, we miss, and he calls. So hopefully, we'll get a free river and get a chance to spike a king. And this is—I'm fooling now. This is a mistake, actually, because the pot is a five to three, and um, I'm five to six. Five point five, five. I'm sorry. Five point six to one to improve by poker office. Uh, I think I'm definitely getting the implied odds. I, I should have uh, thrown in a call there. I, I don't like the re-raise there because um, again he's calling so wide, and it's not enough um, on the table to get it all in. But um, yeah, here I'm going to come out uh, and send my bluff. And that'd be strong enough that if you raise, I'd be willing to put it all in at the flop. And now I'm going to call and play hit to win with a large number of outs. And bang, we hit. And we'll just come out with a big value bet. And hope that he's got something to call with, like a 9 or a 7. And I think he's loose enough, he probably will. If he has that, that stronger hand. Okay, so it would have been nice to get paid off, but we still win a decent sized pot. And we'll try uh, limping with the week 10. And we're just going to come right out betting for value. We'll be that easy. I was going to persist with his loose nature. <laughs> and. Nope. Yes, yeah, so it's re it really can be tough to know. We'll, we'll attack the spun limb for value. Whether a guy is uh, changing around styles on you, or whether his his cards, <laughs> you know, he's just getting good cards and then bad cards and stuff. 
and it's real tough to do that in the Turbo Cinego format where a match often lasts like 20 hands or fewer. <laughs> so uh, there's there's definitely a little bit of a guessing game and it can be a bit of a feeling out process. Uh, here we've got top pair. It's a very vulnerable flop with a lead out. And you know I, I top pair is usually gonna be best here. And this is this is one I'm gonna three bet because <laughs> any heart kills us, but top pair is most likely best against a guy who's as loose as our opponent. Okay, now um, the pot's over a thousand, which is uh, nearly. Oh, oh, it's well, it's well, um, over half our stack. We're just gonna make a pot committing bet. Uh, the top pair is too strong to fold. <laughs> okay, so he just calls. I don't have a clue what that'll indicate, and I think we're gonna check here and hope that um. I mean, we've got a call, obviously, due to pot odds, and, <laughs> okay, he has literally nothing. It's, it's pretty rough. <laughs> um, and you, you could play that, that river, um, I think, either checking to, to induce a bluff when he's behind, or just coming out and betting for value yourself, um, probably aren't too different in terms of EV. Uh, the only real mistake there you can make, of course, would be the fold getting such good odds. And it's a very weak play on, on his part to be the caller in that situation. Okay, here with a couple of backdoor draws as well as an overcard, strong overcard. Go ahead and lead out, and we can either you wouldn't want to call here. You can either three bet or fold. Calling is too passive, and because I think he's calling very loose, I think I'm going to go ahead and give this up against a guy who was uh, more willing to fold. Um, I was playing similarly loose. I think I'll go ahead and three bet them all in there, but not against our man. I'm going to my usual small ball raise with an ace and low pair again is uh, probabilistically going to be the best hand here. This is a situation where I think Queen 8 is strong enough to raise her value and checking is, is slightly weak but not a huge mistake by any means. And that's another situation where generally you check the flop, and then if he checks behind you, bet any turn. If you do th go lead out with a small bet at the flop, that's fine too. And here with three bet, but the odds are too good to fold, regardless of what we had raised with initially. Okay, we got a, a gut saw draw, and that's good enough to, uh, <laughs> well, it's not good enough to call an all in with. <laughs> um, would have been good enough to uh, obviously see bet if he had checked or if he had bet to raise or call um, probably continue on with hand unless he made a big bet and obviously I'm all in and you were making a straight for a raise <laughs> and so against this guy I'm absolutely gonna call there's no question about that um, in general, this would probably still be a call if you didn't know much about your opponent, but <laughs> you wouldn't be too happy with it because you want to avoid really big pots, but, um, you know, with th 300 already on the table and and a strong as ace check, you want to continue there, and, um, yeah, you're for sure. Sorry about that. And, um... Okay, <laughs> he spikes a 10, which is unfortunate. But we got our, our money in when it was, we were a nice favorite, so <laughs> it's always a nice, nice consolation.
Okay, we flop a straight, and we'll definitely just bet right out. You know, um, charge for draw, try to get value. And this guy has been playing enough that I think I might let him take a stab at it. Uh, it's a little risky. Um, if you wanted to just come out with a big bet, that would be a really strong play, too. The only thing not to do, obviously, <laughs> is check call. So we're putting a big raise here. Uh, if you wanted to go right ahead and bet out that turn, that would... You know, against most opponents, you should actually do that. And against even this guy, it's a little marginal. So I'll hope that he... Um, just decides to uh, take a pair way too far. He just <laughs> he just calls, which is really odd. So, you know, the only thing you can do in a situation like this is go ahead and make a big bet for value. You know, and unless he's got the five nine or the nine ten, which is really unlikely, then you've at least got a split. So, <laughs> this, this, I'm just gonna go ahead and make a big value, at it. and he, we could be splitting with fives. <laughs> no, so most likely. He had uh, an 8 or a 7 or something. And wow, we... <laughs> so we only had bottom pair there. And that's obviously extremely... Extremely loose, so... Too loose. I mean, you should be loose and heads up, but... Okay. <laughs> now with, um... Obviously, any pair like deuces, uh... With any four... Uh, two clubs with an overcard... Maybe even two stronger overcards, but now with two uh, marginal overcards and just a queen high. So nothing we can do here. Incidentally, uh, <laughs> he may not be purposely trying to do this, but if okay, getting three to one will call with any two. Um, if he was really thinking about it, playing really big pots wouldn't be such a bad strategy since we, um, you know, I'm going into this match with, with certainly an edge, and, um, if you're up against an opponent who is more experienced than you, you can kind of negate that, um, advantage that experience gives you by forcing your bone to play really big pots. And that's one thing that Jerry Yang did in the last WSOP um, when he won the main event. And he came in with really big raises <laughs> and basically put people to the test. So when there is that kind of skill differential, then um, you, you can absolutely play more long ball style. Okay, here checking is a little weak when he just limps and we have an, an ace high. I check, this is uh, a little weak. A, a better sequence of plays there um, is probably just to go ahead and attack the limp by raising the four blinds and then see betting. Because an ace high figures to be above his range and because he's shown that even though he's very loose, he is capable of folding sometimes. Uh, and this is unfortunate because we pretty much have to play an all-in. You know, if we came in with a big raise, we'd be very pot committed. But we, we like to play the nine king. We're just not willing to play that big a pot in it. We'll, we'll try lumping again, which he's let us do a few times recently. And you can either raise here or just call. But with a gut shot draw to the nuts, you should definitely uh, stay in. And here I think I'm going to semi-bluff raise. And, <laughs> I don't know, maybe this guy might not be the best candidate for that. In general, though, it's, it's really not such a bad time. Because it's kind of unlikely that he's got an ace. And the jack seems unlikely to have helped him. And we do have all, the four six outs, for sure. And now I'm just going to check behind. <laughs> Which turns out to be fortunate, because he, as of the turn at least, was slow playing two pair. Okay, here you can shove, and that might that's probably the stronger play. And this one, um, I make a, a mistake here. I should, 
if, if I don't show up before the flop, definitely go ahead and bet that flop, which shouldn't the figures to be ahead at the time. So it's not quite as bad against this guy because he's calling pretty wide, and we don't necessarily have a made piece. But um, in general, it's, it's not a particularly strong play, uh, at least against the guy who's more capable of folding. And unfortunately now, due to uh, not getting some cards and this guy having a uh, very loose style, we'll go ahead and shove the student 910 with under 10 blinds and chips. Um, due to his style and cards, <laughs> he's managed to chip away at us a little since we lost um, that big all-in ace-jack um, versus uh, jack-10. But um, we're going to go ahead, and particularly with stacks of 10 blinds or less, um, Go ahead and shove a lot before the flop. And now we go in as a, the flop is a nice favorite. And we hold up. Which is very nice. <laughs> and we again have Mount Chip. So we probably, I, I think that was played, you know, you, you could argue a little passively um, for a stretch when I really wasn't getting cards. And I'll go ahead and open fold against the really loose guy with these awkward effective stacks. But, um... You know, when uh, we did get all, all the money in at the end, it, it was as a, um... You know, close to 3-2 to two favorites. Um, against, against this guy, it's, it's not so unreasonable a style to have played if you are ever going to adopt such a passive line. And, um... Now at this point we're gonna go ahead and look to keep on chipping away um, for value. With pocket eights we'll go ahead and make a raise and really hope that um, he decides to uh, to three bet us. Okay, he re raises and we'll just obviously shove all in. And okay, so a we'll flip. We would um, have shoved there with. Uh, I would say, after he made it to 800. Nice. Okay, we take it. Um, with um, maybe pocket sixes or better, and ace eight or better, as well as queen king, I think would be my range against him right there. And so we win the um, four man $11 heads up. And I think this was uh, a couple of really interesting matches. So I really hope you guys enjoyed watching. And this is Colin Moshman, signing off.